just to welcome everyone to um, another session for the Decentering Whiteness discussion series. Um, we are happy today to have our um, organizers, George and Andrew from the um, Vancouver School Board. Um, just a little introduction about them. Um, both are white male settlers who are interested in looking at theoretical and organizational aspects to anti-racist work with the hopes of identifying their own racist practices, working towards unlearning these practices and contributing to building an anti-racist learning environment for their colleagues and students. They both feel they're both um, in extremely privileged positions of power. Um, both George and Andrew work together at McGee Secondary. George is a counselor and member of the Vancouver Secondary Teachers Association. And uh, Andrew is the principal of the school and current chair of the Vancouver Association of Secondary School Administrators. Um, as for me, uh, my name is Kelvin, and I'll uh, help um, facilitate this um, session. Uh, the Edith Lando Virtual Learning Center um, is on the unceded territory of the Masquim people. Um, I am going to pass off to Andrew. Thanks so much, Colvin, um, and thanks to um, you guys who just who, who've made it to join us. Um, might be a small group, um, but we can still, uh, I think, still have an awesome conversation, and we can make it perhaps slightly shorter, and we can just nail off a few points. But we'd love to hear from you um, on some of your perspectives, and perhaps focus more than in the past on um, some of the issues which we work with in our classrooms and schools, um, and. Uh, the the racial and racist positioning of students um, in our schools and how that works um, against our kids. Uh, George and I have been dealing with a really interesting complex case at the moment um, where fortunately there have been quite good um, interaction with Vancouver Police and uh, Ministry of Children and Families. But that certainly does have a racial dimension to it um, with a kid from South South India. Um, and very interesting positioning of that student. Um, and George and I sort of toy in our minds to what degree is this a racist positioning um, and a racist construction of themselves, um, which does come up in a slide later on in, in what we might talk about. So it might still be worthwhile. I mean, I know George and I would, would love to brainstorm um, with you guys, Jacqueline and Heather, and I'm not sure the last person out there, um sure okay fantastic um just some of your experiences and, ob and observations um both george and i are acutely conscious of the fact that we are white male and we identify that way um, and that's been the socialization which was drummed into us um, and coming from south africa during the 1970s um, 60s and 70s and 80s um, there was no doubt around the um, racist socialization that was hammered into me at school um, and in the community. Um, and, you know, I'm very aware of that and how that affects my administration and management as a principal now here in, in Vancouver on the unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Um, which also relates to the fact that uh, by way of introduction, February being Black History Month, um, and how do we um, raise the, the questions of black history in our school and in our staff uh, and in, in our community? Um, and in our last session that we had, we had that the slide of the slave trade um, and the ships and how we can stop those ships. And it's something that George and I have been meaning to put on in our school and we'll do it before the end of this, um, this month. Um, we're just going to project and allow the students to interact with um, that map of the slave trade and, and stop the, the animation uh, and then look and see and learn a, a little bit about the, the individualized impact of slavery and the slave trade. In our staff meeting, we did raise, um, at the beginning of February, we did raise the importance of understanding our privilege that comes from the slave trade. And here in Canada, to what degree and how extensive the wealth of the West is built on the slave trade and slavery. Um, similar exploitation of um, what Ed Said has termed or the Orient, um, Middle East and the East, 
um, similar um, um, gross exploitation of the mineral wealth and the human wealth of um, other parts of the world have benefited the West um, and have allowed for the kind of state structures that have emerged over the past 300 years here in the West. Um, and then more so in, and increasingly through in, in other parts of the world. So these are some of the kind of topics which come up. Um, Iman Laribas did mention, I, I was chatting with him earlier on today, he's just got back from an emergency trip to Saudi Arabia um, and he just got back a day and a half ago. Um, and he asked if he could um, still gather his, um, his sleep um, and if we could excuse him. And, and I said, no, not a problem at all. So. A um, couple of other pieces that on this first slide that um, George and I, when we put this together, um, we try to go along and part of the decentering of whiteness is to, to look at music and artists and, and work from other parts of the world to broaden our such a closed, centralized Western perspective that we have. Um, and this the musician, um, Boom, um, uh, you might want to look up and download some of her music. And I was listening to it again just the other evening. Um, an exceptionally beautiful, uh, interesting um, composer and musician. Um, beautiful music I'm talking about. Um, and I, I, I just was thinking, do I want to keep this in or not? Or do I want to refer folks to, to uh, um, her music? And I was, I was about to take her out, but then listening to it, I thought, you know what? What the hell? It's... it's it's exquisite um, and intricate and worthwhile, I think, listening to. Secondary reading as, as well, um, Bindi's article uh, on organization, organizing gays to education's jailers from Rare Patch earlier on last year. Um, if you were able to read it or if you haven't read it, I think it's, it's provocative. It's, very it's, a, it's a stimulating article focused here in Canada and North America, focusing a lot around Toronto as well. Um, and the debate around taking police out of schools. Um, and it certainly helps, I think, um, broaden our perspective and decenter much of the dialogue around um, police and schools and policing and schools and the relationship between education and policing. Um, I'm not sure if anyone has been able to read it. Um, if you haven't, that's okay. Or if you have, that's fantastic. And, um, and we, we might get to throw around some of the arguments in that. Um, if you haven't been able to watch Frit Essex's interview with uh, Richard Falk um, from a couple of months, from a couple of years ago, um, it's also tangential to some of the other aspects of our conversation. Um, it's relating to the occupied territories um, and Israel's relationship with the Palestinian people um, and the two-state solution. Um, and it's a very thought-provoking um, discussion. Farid Essek was uh, is a scholar in South Africa, Islamic scholar. He's a mullah in, in the religion um, and very prominent South African activist from the anti-apartheid era. Um, and also subsequently, he was um, on the, the first chair of the Human Rights Commission in South Africa, appointed by Mandela. Um, and a, a huge intellect. Uh, he teaches at the Witwatersrand University, um, one of South Africa's um, intellects um, and intellectual uh, giants in the country, um, working together with um, Richard Falk, who's a North American um, scholar and, and um, researcher. Lastly, I'm not sure if any of you have watched Fowder, um, and it's uh, autobiographical, um, um, but a, an interesting take on the Israeli um, occupation in Palestine, and um, from a, yeah, it's from an Israeli perspective, um, but it deals with a unit within the Israeli Defense Force, a hit squad, uh, as we used to call them in South Africa, um, a death squad, as they were called in other parts in, during the wars in Central and South America, um, and but a really interesting series. It's now in season four. Um, and people might um, need, want to watch that. And, and it shows very clearly the, um, that there's no winner in, in any kind of a military occupation and military solution. So I'm just putting those out there. Um, George has watched some of it, but he hasn't been able to get through all of it. Um, not yet. I'm not yet. It. It's um, great. It's on Netflix. It's really easy to access. 
then um, I'm just wondering, uh, Shama and Jacqueline, Heather, did have any of you been able to watch? Have any of you watched Fauda? Do you know the show? I haven't. And Shama, Jacqueline. No, I haven't. D did you say Sharma? Yeah, Manisha okay. Sharma. Yeah. Um, you haven't been able to. You haven't. No. Have you heard? It? Did, did have any of you heard about it? No. You haven't. No. I I heard this probably about four years ago. I well, it wasn't twenty fifteen. This was certainly. <laughs> Uh, probably about five, six years ago, um, I heard them being interviewed on the CBC. Um, and then the show, then it came out. Um, and I think it's available on Netflix. It is. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and um, Esharoff was speaking about his experiences in this particular unit. Um, and in episode one, towards the middle of that, or season one, uh, around about episode five, um, there's an incident that he spoke about um, when his partner, his fiance, was killed in a suicide bombing um, and how that was a catalytic ex experience for him around the pointlessness of what was going on in Israel. Um, and um, part of his therapy was then to write this show, Fauda. Um, and... Uh, it used, it's a very, very authentic um, portrayal of what's going on. Um, and several of my friends who are in the Israeli Defense Force in different capacities um, have watched that. And we've discussed that um, from um, conventional and non-conventional warfare perspectives and looking at that. And, um, and we all, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a show really worthwhile watching um, and but it really emphasizes the pointlessness of all of this um, and the complexity to a certain degree of, of, of some of the issues there. Um, but it also really simplifies things very much from an Israeli perspective. It's, it's an Israeli paid for production. So it's worthwhile seeing. Um, let's just jump quickly forward um, into um, its side and Orientalism. Um, why we thought in the reading group that we would use Ed Said's book, um, Orientalism, because it's a classic um, in the field. And it, it, um, it pulled together um, back in 1979, it pulled together different areas of um, the way the West sees, um, should we say the East? Um, it's the way the West structures a discussion around the Middle East, um, India, China, Japan, um, and that band. We're not talking about um, um, New Zealand or, or Australia as colonized countries. We're just talking here um, around um, Ed Said being from um, Palestine originally or the Lebanon, I think, originally. But um, one of the foremost scholars writing from within the Western institution. Um, and he points out that what Orientalism is, is a way that the West has structured a notion of what um, the Orient is, how the, the Occident, the West, um, has developed um, as an academic field, um, the whole notion of the Orient and the other. Um, and then from there, his, the second part of his key argument is that it's not only an academic field um, where it's housed in key um, institutions in the West, um, foremost institutions such as the School of Oriental and African Studies in, at London University, um, being a, a key proponent of, of Orientalism as a field, um, and then picked up in journals and all the rest of that. Um, and then Orientalism as a style of thought based on distinctions between the Orient and the Occident and the West, um, and based on the, the different theories of knowledge and theories of um, beingness, ontologies and epistemologies. And these are entirely imposed on um, people within the Orient um, from us Western folks. Um, the centralization of, of, of white thinking, should we say. And then lastly, um, for Ed, he shows in the book and he develops the argument in the book um, that this is all about an affirmation of Westernness, a Western way of dominating and structuring and restructuring and having authority over the Orient. 
a form of, a way of saying um, we know you better than yourselves, um, and I think a, a form of Western splaining, should we say, um, not mansplaining, a Western splaining of um, of the Orient, which the the Orient must then absorb, pick up, and accept, uh, and debate with the West on Western terms, um, and. Ed is pointing out that this is all about Western power. This is all about Western control. Uh, and this is all about Western domination of intellectual and material resources at the end of the day. Um, from, from within the university um, and within scholarship, a huge then field of, of Oriental studies was taken forward from um, Syed's work. Um, and... Um, we want to then say, well, okay, that was fine. Um, what about now? Um, and we now are living in a very different world to when it was in 79, when his book came out. And I think the key points that we want to point out around that was that back then we had Orientalism for geopolitics. The scholarship around the Orient from the 1700s to the 1960s was all around geopolitics and geopolitical control. It was, of course, Orientalism was for paternalism, and you'll see this in the next slide, and a Western notion of modernity. Um, and in the next slide, you'll see there's, there's um, examples of healthcare, education, and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, it was driven by a colonial project um, of racialized intellectualism. Um, the West was having a fascination for a constructed other. Uh, think of the veil, um, think of the veils of Maya, and, and um, the construction of that without really understanding what the West, what the, the, the Orient, and it's, it's a huge, vast swath of countries that are grouped into this, which is exactly part of the problem. Um, it's a little bit like saying that Africa is a single country. Um, and then, of course, there's the refracted self. The other is exotic and chaotic and crazy and, and all the rest. But us Europeans are normal and ordered. Um, our form of modernity is the normal, is the way it needs to be, um, and everything else is not modern. And you'll see this in the next slide. Uh, and then a couple of archetypes, which of course come to mind, Lawrence of Arabia and T. Lawrence's um, project, The Seven Pillars of Wisdom, um, which some of you might have seen, you might, have, you might be aware of. Um, then this is a slide that George and I wanted to share, and, and we find it quite striking. Um, it came from 1921 in the Soviet Union. Um, so this is during the Civil War, um, when the Bolsheviks, when the, 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 during the against the Red and the White forces, um, and in all of that, um, the Soviet state was trying to still construct a notion of modernity and a notion of. Um, centralized state governance while they are fighting a civil war. Um, and this, was, this poster came from one of their campaigns um, in Kazakhstan and some of the Soviet republics in the south. And it had a print run of 10,000, which if you think back in the day, um, in 1921, that's fairly substantial. Um, and the slogan there is, um, now as a woman, I am free too. Um, meaning now as a, as a woman, I am free in this new modern state, which is replacing the Tsarist order. Um, and there are many things that, which George and I find interesting in this. On the left, you have your traditional society um, and you have your Muslim-based um, society. Um, and on the right, you have your modern society, which is being brought to you um, as the benefits of the communist revolution. Um, and how we're leaving behind um, the, the old world, which as you can see, the, the bricks are crumbling. Um, and you can see the, the mother and the imams are pleading with um, their, their daughter to come back to the old ways, but she is interested in being free and joining the modern scholarship and the modern institution, which you can see on the right. So it's, you know, these narratives, what we're trying to show here, they weren't only within the Western um, liberal democratic so-called intellectual paradigm and state government structures. It was also very much a part of, um, in this case, um, the socialist Soviet um, Bolshevik um, notion of modernity and modern government. So the tradition 
um, runs quite deep. And the, what we're trying to do is, is decenter that and look to alternatives. Um, more modern nowadays, we've got Ed Said coming uh, and then we've got Franz Fanon, we've got Akio Mbembi, who have taken some of these ideas forward. Um, and many different scholars, as we know, are now saying, look, the whole game of representations consisted of turning individuals, natives and Mbembi's words, into a variety of image types, which we, the powerful, often as teachers, we control the images and we could control the portrayal. Um, and we might be, and, and fortunately, the debate here at McGee around um, BC First Nation Studies courses for the grade 11, 12 level are being very careful now um, about what image types of indigeneity are being presented in our school. Um, and the mindful, very, very mindful, very careful conversation that's occurring here. And I think all secondary schools, I, I trust and hope that um, around that, you know, this we're very, very careful not to present indigenous writing um, from from Western voices, but being very mindful about our positionality. Hey, George, would you agree? What do you say? Do you think so? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think some of us have learned um, how entirely artificial secondary status um, we have grafted onto Indigenous um, people uh, and people from around the other parts of the world, non-Indigenous people as well. Um, and once invented these psychic motifs become um, also, they become formative of the colonial self as well. Um, you know, one thing I wanted to mention, Andrew, was- Yeah, ben go for Ray. it, brother. Yeah, uh, he's, some of his writings are difficult to read because they're so complex and they're so rich, but it's well worth giving it a go because he has some amazing things to share. Yeah, and, and, and from that book on necropolity, um, and we see, uh, the history of the, the, the way history intersects and interacts and works mm -hmm. from South Africa to see how our post-apartheid government has collapsed into from the um, anti-racist project of Mandela to to the gangster state that it is now. Um, and, you know, George and I have been talking about this a bit mm -hmm. um, and how easily that can occur in other parts of the world and can occur um, and this is not a racialized piece. This is a warning to all of us, which is which Mbembe speaks about as well through his notion of becoming black in the world. Um, let's look at Orientalism now, and this is where the notion of um, Islamophobia really starts to come forward. Um, post 9-11 and the invasions of Afghanistan, uh, Syria, Yemen, uh, and the, uh, the American Iraq wars, um, the war on terror, so-called Colin Powell's UN speech, you remember how they constructed this notion um, justifying their invasion, which Tony Blair signed in on and all the rest. Um, if we think of the different settlements, we think of the wall in the US, the United States, and the wall in Israel se um, separating settlements. Uh, so what we have now is a very different form of Orientalism to what was occurring um, when in 79 when, um, when Syed wrote his book. So now it's not no longer about geopolitics, but it's more about domestic politics and the construction of the other uh, and the manipulation of Islamophobia uh, and other phobias and it's more about a domestic audience than an international audience. It's more about controlling our domestic elite um, than about a geopolitical problem. Um, the war on terror was to a large part to a domestic audience while destroying bodies and cultures of people of color. It was played out on other people's bodies, um, but um, it was also a large part for a domestic audience. It's profoundly anti-intellectual. It's profoundly anti-immigrant. Uh, and this is where we come back to Akil Mbembe. It's really part of a necropolitical order. Mm -hmm. And so what Mbembe has argued is that we've got a shift in the nature of government, uh, a shift over the past 40 years from government for people. Um, I'm being very, I'm paraphrasing and I'm simplifying towards a government for the powerful political and economic elite. Um, and that's, um, George, I'm correct in summarizing Akil yeah. in that Yeah, and we just way? spoke about it earlier today, uh, yeah. an hour or two ago, 
Yeah, it's, it's definitely gone now. We were speaking about the oligarchs all around the world. All around, exactly, exactly. And it, it's really, really affecting all of our societies. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Orientalism now is driven more by hatred and fear, um, and and then and misogyny within that. Uh, it's an Orientalism of walls, a fear of the immigrant, and a fear of the outside, the insider or a constructed insider, uh, which you, you would see if you watch that in, Fa in Fowder. Uh, and that translates um, in today's thinking around um, Islamophobia. And that is the phobia of against Islam. Uh, and um, as far as we see it, um, how does this, well, there's examples, we can pull on different examples. And I'm just, that one came to mind, or well, Ralph Goodall back in, 2020 speak referring to the shooting down um in iran of flight ps 752 um and good ale there was ranting on about that the iranians can't be investigating the shooting down in iran of of this flight um which was which occurred when there was an unidentified plane um and the um operators of the missile battery shot it down because that was their orders um but there's no similar logic in that case when, for example, Canadians, ca Canadian paratroopers in Somalia, we, they investigated themselves for their atrocities and Joint Task Force 2 in Afghanistan, Canadian units, uh, similar in a sense, I think, slightly, partially, have some echoes to the Fowder kind of a unit um, and some of their activities in Afghanistan. Um, no, that was investigated by Canadian forces. So the hypocrisy of, of our um, position, um, we don't want to acknowledge. It's, it's, this comes back to the modern sovereign, which um, Akil Mbembe was speaking about. And um, we're thinking here, uh, the classical political theory, Thomas Hobbes, John Locke Rousseau, all the rest of them. Um, that's the foundation, the white-centered, when we want to um, decenter whiteness. A central part of, of white educational thinking relates to the structure of the state. Um, and our educational framework and structures are set in place um, per the definitions of state and government that come from Hobbes and Locke and, and Jacques Rousseau. Um, but today's sovereign which is Locke's term and Hobbes's term, the modern sovereign is not like the sovereign of Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau. Um, and this is Mbembe's point. Today's sovereign consists in the power to manufacture, um, ma manufacture people, manufacture elites, um, and a crowd of people who live on the edge of life. Um, people for whom living means constant, constantly standing up to death. This life is superfluous, therefore whose price is so meager that it has no equivalence, whether market or even less human. Um, and whether market he's referring to slaves and the buying and selling of, of people as slaves. Um, and in today's society, today's world, um, the, the world that Islamophobia inhabits, um, people aren't even slaves. Um, Nobody even bears the slightest feelings of responsibility or justice towards this sort of life or rather death. Contemporary power proceeds by a sort of inversion between life and death. Life is merely death's medium. Um, and Mbembe as a modern political theorist and a po political scientist, his argument that this is the structure of the state today. And for George and I, we say recognizing that What's the role of education within that? What's the role of our school, McGee Secondary, within if this is the notion of the state? Um, and then we can say, well, this is Canada. It's not quite so bad. Um, and we can sh say, sure, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, and both George and I have to still be aware to the possibility that we're still complicit and responsible um, as educators. Um, and it's our role, it's our moral responsibility to understand the possible, the potential of education in this kind of a society. Um, and I'm just, I just wouldn't mind stopping there for if um, Shama or Jacqueline, uh, Heather, if you have any thoughts on where we're, how, how we're moving so far. Am I moving too fast? 
I'm trying to capture things in a little bit of a nutshell. Yeah, your your thoughts so far, and your from your educational frameworks, um, and your cultural and your positionalities. Um, do you have anything to share? Any anything that's coming to mind or being triggered here? I feel like I just need more time to think it all through. It's very interesting. Exactly. Yeah, I, and I'm, yeah, we're bombing you with a hell of a lot here. Uh, of course. Um, some of it, uh, you know, I'm thinking back to, you know, South Africa in the 1980s during the liberation struggle when I was at university. Um, and so things were much, you know, conversations and discussion like this uh, was, was occurring um, and occurring in the context of, what kind of society and what kind of state are we going to build in South Africa post-liberation? Um, and so we were doing various experiments in the townships around uh, anti-racist curriculum um, and in underground schools that were being organized and being run where we would try to develop anti-racist material uh, and work with students in the townships. Um, so experiments, I mean, that's kind of a, it's, it's a, it's the wrong word to use, but we were trying, we were piloting, we were piloting some of the material on, on, on government structures and curriculum structures and frameworks and all of that. Um, and, and so we were trying to, to understand what's the role of education um, and how does education contribute to a modern state um, and what's the form of the modern state. Uh, and then during those struggle days, there would be, we have various um, discussion groups um, within the union movement, within the teachers union movement with SAD2 um, and then structures and um, organizations before SAD2 that were banned. Um, and um, we would have these different discussion groups in the nights and the evenings in some of the townships where we would debate some of this stuff. Um, so partly I miss it, but um, you know, Canada is a different place. Um, and so George and I and Alpha and, and we have some, we do talk about how can we, what's our role, what's our responsibility. Um, and teachers have been doing this as well. The BCTF has, has had a very, very strong role uh, in terms of supporting social justice and understanding the link between social justice and education. And a very, very, it's, it's such a central um, link because a student can't come to our school if they're feeling stressed and worried. Um, and whether they're being bullied, whether they're being harassed, intimidated, um, whether it's a racial or a class intimidation that's occurring, um, it's still occurring. And the BCTF for its whole history virtually has been very aware and alive to understanding that relationship. Um, and I think part of this discussion group, and this is why George and I are doing it in partnership, is to um, show that administrators and teachers can do it together and we can discuss and think about it together. Um, and then when we build a timetable, we can think, is this playing a role in here or is this just a technical exercise? How are our values being reflected uh, in all of our disciplinary conversations with kids and with families? Um, and what can we do to make sure that um, we recognize the past? Um, George, do you have any thoughts? Any, any no. thinking there? Right on track there, right on track. What resonated with me most of what you just said is like when we have kids coming to school and they, they have to feel safe um, or learning can't really happen. Um, they can't have a child come to school and be terrified for whatever reason. And uh, it is our moral responsibility to, to help create a safe environment for all our kids and our yeah. staff. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and as the, the principal, I mean, of course, you know, they always say, oh, it's all about the kids. It's all about the kids. But, you know, it's everything I'm trying to argue as an administrator is no, as admin, it's all about the teachers. Teachers have to feel safe. They have to feel respected. They have to be honored. And that then trickles down to the classroom environment. Um, so that takes us a little bit away from some of the pieces around um, the topic um, of Islamophobia. One other thing I'm just going to throw out, and, and I mentioned this to you earlier, George, um, the, there's, a, see, there's a podcast um, out there called The Highwaymen. 
Um, yeah. And so Sharma and Jacqueline and Heather, um, if you don't mind, just scribble it down, the Highway Men podcast. Uh, and it comes from a, a South African newspaper, um, liberal left um, newspaper online as well, called the Daily Maverick. Um, and you know, if, so if you type in Daily Maverick, the Highwaymen, it's a phenomenally interesting uh, eight part podcast, um, a little bit of South African humor thrown in a bit. Um, but what they're arguing is um, from the vision of, Man of Mandela and the vision of the African National Congress during the liberation struggle, um, Albert Lutuli, one of another one of the, the great leaders of the ANC and, and African intellectuals, um, post uh, anti-colonial intellectuals and activists, um, from those visions, um, we have descended to this gangster state. Um, and they they use the notion of highwaymen who who as as in back in the day there would be the highwaymen um, that would rub carriages. Well, now we have um, some of our key leaders, um, including our former state president um, and other leaders in South Africa, and they show how they have the country has descended into this kind of a um, necropolitical modern sovereign as Mbembe. Mbembe is currently working in Johannesburg, working in, in Bits University. So he's in the midst of this as well. Unfortunately, they don't reference necro the, the Mbembe and Mbembe's work. Um, and, but it's the two are the same thing. It's the same argument being made. Another point that's made in the show is how easily it can occur in other parts of the world and how easily it is occurring um, already in places like the United States and, and even here in Canada. Um, we're just fortunate that our wall is, is the ocean, the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans. And the other wall is um, the Northern Sea, the, the current ice fields um, of the North. But those walls are just as solid um, as some of the other walls uh, and prevent immigrants coming to this country. Um, we would be dealing with, with exactly the same kinds of problems, of course. So give it a listen, um, because it illustrates a lot of the arguments of the modern sovereign and, and listening to it as well as what are we as educators, what's our role in, in being part of this um, and being part of the solution. I think it's quite key in there. So just throwing that one out. Um, another example, and this comes from the Richard Falk um, interview of Islamophobia and how it works. Um, and if you listen to the Richard Falk interview, and he's, he's coming from a rabbinical perspective, a Jewish perspective as well. Um, and he says, he points out that, um, you know, at, at five minutes into the interview, um, within the Judaic tradition that we are not a chosen people. Um, and from his understanding of Judaism, um, then this is a, that's a constructed piece. Um, and it's constructed by a certain tradition within um, within Jewish religious thinking and practice. Um, and from his understanding and from his perspective, a more uh, probably a liberal perspective, um, they're chosen to serve justice. The Jewish nation um, is chosen to serve justice, not considering themselves a chosen people. Uh, he then moves on to international law and the occupation, looking at issues around that, and then debates constructions around homeland and the state. Uh, another article throwing out, um, Griffiths and Repo, Antipoed article, 2020. Um, there's a link as well um, that people might want to look at. And then in that, that Twitter link um, is an incident that occurred and occurs countless times. This was one that was recorded and put out on Twitter um, by a journalist um, who is recording a, the stopping of an ambulance by um, Israeli uh, military uh, and being a conscript in South Africa, um, I can very strongly identify with a lot of the chaos of that moment of, of what, you, what you watch there. Um, and so soldiers stop an ambulance and they try to arrest um, the person in the ambulance and the doctors, the medical um, um, folks are trying to stop this arrest because their job is to save lives and to help people. Um, but it presents a view of, of what's going on and, and the way um, Islamophobia plays out uh, in the lives of, of 
the soldiers uh, as perpetrators and victims um, and the victims um, in that situation. Another excellent piece is um, Nathan Thrall's um, article in New York Review of Books uh, from 2021. Um, again, just speaking to the reality of lives in the occupied territories. Uh, and then also the last reference there, Bichelem, um, the Israeli Information Center for Human Rights in the Occupied Territories. Um, Bichelem is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, resource. We used to have a lot of those in, in, during, in South Africa, um, human rights organizations in different ways, which were presenting um, the experience of people, which might not be the narrative what the South African government was wanting to get out there. Similarly, Bichelem has been severely criticized in, within Israel. Um, I'm trying not to make any um, statement on my personal beliefs about what's going on there. Um, Bechelem has said from within the Israeli perspective and Israeli world um, that Israel is an apartheid state. Um, apartheid state structures were defined by the United Nations um, and South Africa was identified as one of those. Um, and um, I, think I would just encourage folks to take a look at that as well if they're interested and seeing this aspect of Islamophobia playing out uh, and then coming back, bringing it back, owning it for ourselves and, and seeing what do we want to do about it and how can we. So this brings us to getting out of the swamp. Um, and I use the word swamp um, carefully there. It has a particular resonance here in Vancouver and in Vancouver schools. Um, and my wife experienced the swamp here at one of our local schools um, back in the 1980s um, and 1990s. Um, getting out of the swamp is partly the understanding of language and that comes up in Fauda, uh, language and culture. Paulo Freire comes up, I'm not sure um, if you guys, many of you, I'm not sure if you've read that, read Paulo Freire and Gugi Watiango, another one of the African scholars on the importance of the link between um, language and culture. Uh, we've already uh, mentioned uh, Orm's music. Um, Mansoor is another one, another phenomenal musician uh, in, in hip hop. And then um, this music of hers, Hamandula, is something to watch. Uh, and I think these links are out there. Um, an interview of hers speaking about the importance of music and art and culture uh, in speaking back to and the kind of uh, racist orientalism uh, that, has, that has emerged over the past 100 years, 150 years. And then um, I'm moving along quite quickly. Um, and then the last point that I think George and I want to speak about um, is the importance of witnessing um, and the link between us as Western folks um, and here in Canada, um, being aware of learning and keeping learning, keeping on reading and reading from diverse sources and looking to diverse sources and finding those diverse sources and witnessing um, and watching. And then when the conversations come up, we can um, speak our experience and our observations. Um, and uh, the material is out there uh, that relates back to our very first session um, and um, where we speak about, you know, we know and we know what's going on and we can't say we didn't know. Um, and that excuse of saying we don't know, or well, heck, I never knew, um, while well, the material is there. Um, and George and I, when we had a few weeks ago uh, here at McGee, we had a semester turnaround experience, four days, well, two days. And one of the films that was shown for students um, was the film Invasion that we showed in our last session. Um, and that as a form of witnessing in terms of, of land invasions uh, and, and um, anti-pipeline protests uh, in the Gitsan territories up north. Um, and I think that's something that it's another form of witnessing. And just as we can witness and stand with indigenous um, people as allies, I think it's important for us to witness and stand as allies um, and call out Islamophobia when it occurs. And for George and I, um, in this current situation at our school that we're watching and observing and being very careful that um, not to reposition a student and just to be very careful witnesses um, as we work around discipline um, of all of the students in our school and in our community. 
Andrew, one interesting part of that, that video invasion is when um, the speaker, the leader, she was speaking about resettling the land. Yeah. And, and that to me was really powerful because uh, moving to the cities or being cornered into a reservation and the, and she was adamant about the, it's the land and resettling it. And it just really struck, struck a chord with me in a good way in the sense that it's, it's um, the community there doesn't want to separate themselves from the land. And, and that's super important. Exactly. And, and, and certainly within that, that film, um, I'm not sure if, I mean, we watched it in the, in, in the last session um, with Glenn and Glenn was able to speak to it as well. Um, but I, I'm, we're, we're drawing a parallel through this um, as a, as a form of witnessing. Yeah. And, and then occupation of the land, exactly in in the Gitsan territories um and moving beyond the reservations um which is what they were right um here in Musqueam um how here from McGee down to the Musqueam land was all Musqueam nation and farmer McGee grabbed this land and as we have a school named after him um and how can this land be resettled well it can be also done spiritually, and that's exactly why the Masquerim Nation have allowed us to build a welcome pole um, facing the nation. Um, that yeah, and George, you know, you, and you're so much a part of that project too. Um, so that's sort of as much as I think we want to talk through. Um, we 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 really haven't had much of a dialogue. Uh, Sharma, Heather, and Jacqueline, do you have any thoughts, any any observations from your experience and from from where you're at? Um, how, any 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 comments which you have from from even within your school perspectives um, and your experiences around administrators and how we deal with race and racism and um, how our openness to learning and decentering our thinking. Um, I try to do that. I don't know how effective I am, George. You you're a you're a, you're an ally and and keeping me grounded. Oh, you're <laughs> you've been great. I mean, even today, I had a student, a former student who graduated 2019, came to visit, and uh, she was commenting on, "Wow, look at all the art here." So then then she asked about the spinder wall that was her grad class's gift to the school. Mm -hmm. So I took her out to see it, and she saw the other art, and then. We showed her the staircase, which has the Musqueam art on it now, too, and the columns. And she thought it was so cool. And mm. uh, because that stuff wasn't there just four years ago, it wasn't there. Mm. So that's, yeah, for me, that's another example of witnessing. Um, and we're doing it together with uh, the Musqueam Nation mm -hmm. um, and absolutely a part of resurgence politics. Um, and, and hopefully it gets picked up by other schools uh, in terms of our allyship um, and in terms of decentering the whiteness and taking down all those pictures of those old, those white principles that we had before. Um, and sent, and that whole notion of centralized power that comes from the, you know, the principle um, and delegating and trying to turn that around and, and, and push responsibility out to the teacher colleagues. I think that's part of the way we, I try to decenter whiteness uh, and the, the structures of administrative power. Um, of course, ultimately, and according to the School Act, I'm still responsible. But there's still ways, I think, which we're trying to go along and find different ways of doing it. Um, and, you know, you know, Heather and Jacqueline Chama, I'm not sure your thoughts and your experience, um, what you try in your classrooms, how you try to decenter power in your classrooms um, to create a more democratic and open and transparent space. Um, I know exactly how difficult it is, um, but how's it going for you? We might not all have teachers here too, Andrew. So yeah. it could yeah. be just in the uh, workforce outside of schools as well. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this is Jacqueline. I was just actually going to say that, that I'm not a teacher. And uh, to your point about learning, um, you know, this, this session is outside of my, it's not outside of my purview because I'm within, um, I am the manager of culture within a small rural city, um, but the focus on teaching is outside of kind of my scope. But I work with our community um, 
to help bring voice to those voices who have been underrepresented, underrepresented, mm -hmm. you know, you know, through colonialization. And, and uh, I find our biggest challenge or one of our challenges right now is um, in an effort to be inclusive and equitable um, and to, you know, I'm reading a book right now on white fragility and, mm -hmm. and, come kind of the unconscious bias um, I find we're getting caught up and it's taking time and there needs to be time but it's um, you know in order to be equitable and inclusive I find you know especially us like I am a white woman um, uh, heterosexual middle-aged woman well-educated I'm from the east coast actually which is kind of fun being in a West Coast conference call right now. Um, so I grew up in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Anyway, um, but, you know, that's my perspective. So in trying to make sure that we're inclusive, it just takes, I feel like we're, we're, we're getting, uh, I don't even know what the word is. I'd probably say the word bogged down, but that would be not the right word. Mm. But it's taking a lot more time. And, and we're afraid, maybe it's, is that's the, the, the thing I want to say is, is we're afraid to like take that next step for fear that it wasn't enough. Um, and, and we didn't do enough of the work and the witnessing and, and reaching out to enough people. So I'm just in the midst of um, actually working with our community to create an advisory group for our, I work for municipal government. So, um, and that process has been wonderful and we're very excited to um, work with our community and bring a broad range of perspectives into that um, advisory group. But you know, in defining what a broad range of perspectives are is is challenging, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And it's yeah. you have to move to the next stage. So, you know, just anyway, that's just my um where we're at right now and one of the things that I'm working through right now. And so, you know, coming on to this session was, you know, in terms of, you know, hearing what other people are lived experience, I thought this would be a wonderful opportunity yeah it's it it is it is incredibly complex um and identity politics and the identity politics that um we're we're flowing within and into um there that's a huge minefield there and we're dealing with legacies of pain and generations of trauma and degenerational trauma as you know um and as you've experienced as and and as you witness uh and yeah there's no textbook at, at all on that um just one thing i'm going to throw out there there's an incredible exhibition um put out by the national museum of australia um national museum of australia and it's called song lines s-o-n-g-l-i-n-e-s song lines same title as a book by bruce chatwin from back in the day um and take a look at that um, and I'm just throwing out a very curve ball, very different ball here. Um, and it's quite inspiring to see what um, that museum did and how they did it. Um, and spend some time looking at some of the, the, the resources and the material there. Um, and then see how you can translate some of that into your own context. Because they, they work together with indigenous elders to preserve the voices of um, the uh, Aboriginal elders in a particular community and around a particular story um, of the seven sisters uh, is just a really, really beautiful, quite an incredible thing. Georgia, I haven't shared with you too much of this one, um, but I was also thinking of integrating this into Black History Month here at McGee um, because it's a side ball and it decenters, it disconcerts people, I think. They're all expecting, most of us are expecting Black History Month in a school situation, um, Jacqueline, to focus really on um, Black Canadians' contributions here in British Columbia or in Vancouver, et cetera, et cetera. And for me, it's a much bigger project than that. And so um, I was thinking of putting on something to do with the songlines here in the school. 
Um, but yeah, um, Jack, and take a look at that and see what what um, there's some kernels in there. I think of process and structure, and then outcome, um, and that I think might work in in your community as well in terms of celebrating um, and resurrecting, preserving, protecting uh, the voices of indigenous um, in the Songlands case predominantly an indigenous woman um, and indigenous woman knowledge keepers. Um, I think it might be quite cool for you guys. Um, Sharma and Heather, um, you guys got any thoughts uh, from your, from your perspectives? Are, are you guys in schools, uh, elementary, secondary? Well, I'm a, I'm a secondary teacher, so I teach French and Spanish. All right. I think it's always important in the language classroom to talk about why we study these languages as opposed to other languages. Yeah, um, yeah. So I like to start off early on in the semester with um, the question of what is the role of French or Spanish, which has whatever one it is, on ind Indigenous territory. And right. that's a difficult question for most students to answer. Some students can get pretty deep into it, but a lot of students need a bit more guidance in getting to the point that, well, it's a colonial language. And we talk about a bit about the role of colonialism, genocide, both in our territory and why we're learning these languages over Hunkwaminam but mm -hmm. also um, in the t other territories where these languages are spoken and the value in learning them is because they're so widely spoken and yet they're widely spoken because of the harms that have been done in other parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's exactly why in, in some of our sessions, yeah, we bring in music as language from, uh, from other parts of the world to, to center some of those experiences too, um, because we, we just don't get it here. We don't get exposure. Unless you're like yourself that goes out and finds it. Um, and, and I'm just thinking of our incredible um, Spanish teacher that we have. Well, all of our languages teachers that we have at, here at McGee. Um, but in particular, Noemi is a phenomenal, phenomenal um, teacher and sounds very much like yourself in terms of situating, locating, um, and then bringing in uh, voices from other parts um, of the world that speak um, the language and they've taken it over as their own um, in your case in French um, the different versions of French and Bembi speaks to that too um, then any other thoughts and any other aspects to witnessing and and how how we can do that as a way of decentering whiteness um, and centering other people's experience um, any any other perspectives any thought thinking Just looking. Um, sort of moving on slightly and sticking with uh, witnessing and memory. Um, I've referred a little bit to that. Um, and then the article by, um, by Bindi's article in um, Brea Patch. Um, Brea Patch is a sort of, is a left journal uh, magazine, um, more popular kind of writing. Um, and it's it's an interesting article. Um, and Jacqueline, I'm not sure if um, that you would find that too useful. Um, of course, it's very focused on education. It fits more within some of the identity po politics kinds of discussions as well. Um, but I think it's very useful for educators to read um, if, if folks have the time. Um, but more importantly, I want to go to this last slide. Um, and coming back to Akilah um, and his he's, he's as you know, Islamophobia and anti-blackness as parts of governmental structures. Um, and Jacqueline, you're working within government. Um, George and I within government as well within the education sector to be aware of of the anti-blackness and anti and Islamophobia that is a, a structured aspect of of what we are doing. Um, part of the structures of government. So Akil suggests I put forward the notion of necropolitics or necropower as a necro as in death worshipping uh, to account for the various ways in which in our contemporary world weapons are deployed in the interest of maximally destroying people and creating death worlds. And these aren't only just weapons of mass destruction or weapons of mass destruction as being used in um, by Russia at the moment and, and um, the weapon of education. Um, weapon of healthcare, and this is—I want to make sure that 
my profession is not doing this because we have um, the residential schools. We have done this. And in South Africa, education was a fundamental part of the colonial project, of course. Um, in the interest of destroying people and creating death worlds, uh, that is new and unique forms of social existence in which vast populations are subjected to living conditions that confer on them the status of the living dead. Um, so Akil is really speaking as a scholar from the global south. Uh, he is speaking his truth, his experience. Uh, the slide in the background there is from Syria um, during the, the war, the civil war um, in Syria, which is really also all about the control of, of resources and mineral resources and oil um, through the Syrian state. Uh, the earthquake which has just occurred there, uh, there's a fantastic uh, article in the Manchester Guardian online, which people might want to read um, from a um, Turkish um, PhD student uh, in town and regional planning uh, and speaking to um, the tragedy that is occurring currently in Turkey. Um, my neighbor has just lost six members of her family um, and she's just wanting to go back to Turkey to be with um, the survivors of her family and do what she can to go back. Um, but also part of town and regional planning and the construction, the housing construction, the corruption within the building um, and the inspections of the housing and structures of housing that were built recently in the past 10, 15 years um, that just simply collapsed on, on families um, resulting in such a tragic death toll. Um, and, that death Andrew, toll yeah. Would you say that's part of the gangster state you referenced to earlier? It wasn't Syria or Turkey, but are you seeing that same thing happening there? 100%, 100%. It's the same argument and it's the same, exactly the same thing. Um, and it's how we have to be so vigilant when against corruption uh, in, in, in certainly within our country and within wherever, how it plays itself out, right? Um, and and uh, yeah, for us educators, um, it's, this is what we try to present within the VASA as an organization framework. And I know you guys in the BCTF um, have been very, very aware of um, how important the role, how important education as, as a tool for state construction and formation of consciousness. Uh, and we work with kids across 12 years. Um, we have an influence and it's just to be mindful um, and aware of, of how powerful our role is. Um, so really, I want to thank um, Heather and Sharma as educators for joining us, uh, Jacqueline for joining us, um, and um, George, of course, for working with us all the time on these things. Um, Kelvin, I'm not sure if you're still there. Um, it, anyone, any last thinking comments? Um, of course, reach out if you if you can um, online or reach out through email. George and my emails are, are I think you can reach out and know. I can um, send them out. Yeah. Right um, and thanks for any feedback. Um, of course, we are. This doesn't have a direct one-to-one -one correspondence with um, the unit that I'm planning on teaching tomorrow, but it certainly is part of the um, the drumbeat, the drone time um, experience that uh, structures and and our educational experience. Uh, last comments to anyone out there. All right. All right. Um, Oh, uh, I guess would I just say something, Jackie? I was just going to say, um, just in terms of this slide, like this is, um, you know, an end of a spectrum. But if we're looking at our own roles and responsibilities within, you know, our local governments and our, our in our local jobs, how does this apply? And and, and we just need to be reflective on the things that we do that maybe aren't this extreme, but yep. have those, you know, have an impact on the lives of the people we work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the kids which are coming into our classrooms from other parts of the world, 
are bringing these experiences and and are bringing them uh, into our classrooms and into our schools. And adults who are coming into work and volunteer in our schools have life paths which come from all kinds of experiences. George and I have a very close colleague who, who generally is with us, couldn't make it today, uh, Alpha and Bira, Alpha, um, and uh, he works for Help Change My City. Um, and uh, he was in our school yesterday with a group of volunteers working with our grade eights. Uh, and there was a new person that he was bringing in. Um, and I said, oh, Alpha got a new volunteer. He said, yeah, for sure. Um, and I said, oh, where's he, where's he from? And how long has he been in Canada? Just arrived uh, from Eastern Nigeria. And I said, and Alpha said, oh, the guy's in shell shock. Um, and I said, yeah, sure, I can understand that. Um, Eastern Nigeria is very different to, to here. Um, uh, of course, right? And then I said, mm, but has he, did he travel through Lagos? Um, and so the city of Lagos is the city that is described by Mbembe. Um, and that whole, the unique forms of social existence that we rely on, on the dysfunctionality, but we can still benefit from the oil that comes out from the oil facilities of, of Lagos. Um, and Shell is benefiting from that, and so is my pension. Um, and this, this uh, volunteer has traveled, he's lived, he's worked, walked in those communities, and he's seen it, he's witnessed it. Um, it goes way beyond um, anything which we've experienced here at McGee. Um, and so he really needs to understand that he can contribute so much to the lives of our students. Um, and our students are so incredibly privileged to have a person who has seen what it's possible of when things fall apart um, and, and how easy it is for things to fall apart and how difficult it is to construct a mindful society um, and, a, and a caring society. Um, and that's what we try to do in, in public education. That's, I think, the history, the future of public education. Um, yeah, so of course, yeah, it's, that's an extreme. And, and but yeah, the, the people coming to our schools are shell-shocked and numb and, and from their experiences in different parts of the world. Um, it puts more pressure on your counselors, but also on the teachers who are working with kids and parents who have, have lived this world. Any other comments there? Really appreciated that, Jack. Sounds good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, guys. As always, we, it's a serious topic and serious thinking, and really appreciate that you give your time to be with us and, and that we can be part of this. Really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much.